Hello and welcome to SheThePeople.tv's Women Writers Fest. Today I'm thrilled to be in conversation with the widely acclaimed and much loved Janice Pariath. Janice is the author of Boats on Land, a collection of short stories, Seahorse, a novel, and the international bestseller, The Nine Chambered Heart. She was a recipient of the Young Writer Award from the Sahitya Academy and the Crossword Book Award for Fiction in 2013. Janice's work has been translated into 10 languages. She teaches at Ashoka University and lives between Delhi and Shillong with a cat of many names. Janice has recently come out with a luminous new book, Everything the Light Touches. Welcome, Janice. It's such a pleasure to be chatting with you. Hello, Archana. Thank you for your wonderfully generous introduction. My pleasure. Very happy to be here. Yeah. Uh, Janice, you were brought up in Meghalaya, the wettest place on earth, and Assam. You grew up in the hills and plains, and it seems to be uh, to have been an idyllic childhood. Now, I want to know whether as a child you were, the, you were conscious of the beauty around you. I ask because most of us don't even bother to look at a tree that grows outside the window. You know, so it's not as if you're constantly appreciating that. So, but when I picture you, I picture you as a child talking to maybe talking to plants, you know, collecting leaves. And it seems to be a very idyllic childhood. So what is your earliest persistent memory? Um, I was very lucky and very privileged to have grown up between the hills of home here in Shillong and pockets of Assam, beautiful, wild, uh, Assam and I had in some ways the best of both worlds the hills and the plains um, the pine forests and the vast rivers um, and they're very different landscapes of course um, but they each you know fed me and inspired me and nourished me um, in different ways of course I did also grow up I was very little at the time but I did grow up at a, at a time of uh, a lot of political turbulence here in Assam, in Meghalaya. So, of course, because I was much too little to understand exactly what was going on, it seemed quite idyllic to me. Um, of course, there was tension in the air. I remember my grandmom rushing out to get bread and milk and, you know, um, hearing words like curfew and um, CRPF and again, not quite understanding those uh, terms. But um, for me, I was mostly then on endless holiday um, mm. because schools were closed um, and, you know, it all felt like a perpetual summer vacation. And I spent a lot of time outdoors, especially in Assam. Um, I had quite a solitary childhood, I have to admit, with my books and pets and, you know, dogs and ducks and uh, doves and um, chickens. I would, you know, feed them through the day and look after them and, um, you know, wander around the vegetable garden with the gardeners. Um, and so I was very much, um, you know, as you said, ensconced in the natural world. I don't think, though, that it's something I truly um, appreciated until much later. Maybe that's what we do best. We <laughs> we look back and we think, oh, that was rather lovely. <laughs> um, but I think after many years of being away and, you know, living in cities and working in cities and studying in cities, only then did I begin to appreciate it and acknowledge how um, incredibly lucky and privileged I was to, um, you know, to grow up uh, within surroundings like that. Your childhood was filled with folk tales from the Khasi community. You had a grandmother who narrated tales. And some of that culture, of course, including the language you lament, was lost to uh, colonization. And yet your stories have the mystical, uh, magical realism, folklore. So how did you unearth what was lost? Mm. Um, I think I've also only recently grown interested in um, 
the history of our language in these hills. Um, I think because of the kind of edu education that we, um, you know, we were privy to, that we had access to, uh, so very much sort of, you know, convent school educated, um, and then of course DU studying English literature, and then London studying more English literature. It was an education and an upbringing that was very uh, attuned to looking west, looking at a very particularly Eurocentric um, way of narrating and understanding the world. And I think it takes so long, at least it's taken so long for me to unlearn a lot of those narratives or at least to learn to reassess, reinterrogate, uh, you know, those uh, narratives. And I think in that journey, um, in some ways, I've traveled home. Um, I've traveled home physically, geographically, of course, to a certain place where I spend um, much more time than I used to. But also it's made me much more aware of, you know, the language that I lost as a child because, you know, I went to an English medium school, studied English, English literature, etc. Um, and it's been... Um, you know, a, a, a relearning, a reclaiming in some ways of the place as well as the language. I don't know if you can do one without the other, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I think in 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 reawakening, um, you know, the language Kasi in me and in my life, I think I re-remembered all the stories that, you know, I would hear as a child that I grew up with and in some ways had um, not dismissed, but put aside, set aside, um, you know, for other stories. Um, and it's been a real rediscovery in many ways, because, you know, I can quote Keats and Tennyson, but I cannot quote the poets of our hills, you know, So So Tham, for example. And this kind of misalignment is something that I've been trying to... Um, you know, heal. Um, I've been trying to um, um, to re, uh, you know, to to fix in some ways. Um, and I think this is where, um, you know, I've also realized how our stories, our folk stories, our folk tales, are so intricately linked to landscape. So to walk the landscape here is to walk through stories. Uh, we live in a very storied landscape. Um, there will be, you know, a folk tale about a particular mountain, a particular waterfall, um, the spirits of the forest. Um, and so landscape and story and language are intricately enmeshed. And I think that's one of, um, you know, the themes, one of the um, you know, things that I, I tried to explore in everything the light touches that, you know, when you live in a storied landscape like this, all it takes is for you to relearn how to read, um, how to listen to the landscape, to the stories. That's so wonderful. Uh, and the title of your new book, Everything the Light Touches, well, I'm fascinated by it. What is it? that light touches. It has science, spirituality, and this very magical air. And in fact, I've also been reading Boats on Land. And mm -hmm. uh, in one of the stories, I think Pilgrimage, the character Vivek points out to the hill and says, no matter what happens and where we land up, just like that light, I will always be there and I will always return. I mean, there is so much hope. And for want of a better word, tell us a little more about this fascination with light and how, how you came to choose this title. Hmm. Right. Okay. Um, I think the light in the title, you know, gestures towards many, many things, as I think, um, you know, a title ought to Um it depends very much on who the reader is who comes to this book. And I would hope that the light um, within the title and within the book, within the pages, 
um, ends up meaning different things to different readers. Um, but for me personally, um, it begins with um, the light of curiosity, um, which is where the book begins as well. All the characters, uh, and in some ways, including me as the writer, um, you know, we all begin from a space of curiosity, um, of a space of wanting to know more, a, a space of seeking. Um, and so, you know, this is the light of curiosity and wonder um, that I think has driven, you know, some of our most incredible and most beloved stories, you know, the theme of the quest of wishing to go out and seek and explore and discover. And it is very much this light, this light of, you know, of wanting to learn, of being perpetual students in some ways. Um, you know, this is the light um, that the, the, the word and the title gestures to at one level. Um, it's also uh, the light, of course, um, uh, because it, it, it plays um, or explores in some ways the tussle between indigenous faith and Christianity, the coming of Christianity, especially to, the, to these hills. It's, you know, it's the light of faith, um, of spirituality, as you said, of belief, um, but not necessarily always Christian, um, but a belief system that you know, is much more indigenous and of the land and of um, nature. Um, and also, um, I would add, it's the light that keeps us alive. It's the light that falls on every leaf on this planet. It's the light that falls on our faces in the morning when we turn up you know, our heads up to the sun. Um, it's the light that nourishes us and keeps us, keeps us alive and sustains us. And um, it's a beautiful, generous thing. It falls on all of us equally, regardless of who we are and where we come from and how many riches we've gathered. It falls on, on us all. There is always light. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and your novel is genre defying it's very ambitious it's historical and what was the germination point and when you conceived it was it in this very form or when you began writing it I mean or did this all happen organically mm, right um, I think um, quite befittingly um, the story the book the idea the seed of the novel actually came to me in a garden. Um, I was uh, living in the UK um, almost a decade ago, and I was visiting one of you know one of these famous gardens, um, and um, I think it was in Salisbury. I don't quite remember, but in one corner of the garden there was this small exhibition on women botanists from the Victorian and Edwardian. Um, ages. And I was fascinated, you know, by their lives, by their stories, because they truly led bold, unruly lives at a time when, you know, it wasn't considered very appropriate for women to be doing the things that they were doing, traveling off on their own and looking for plants and, you know, doing the things that men do. Um, and in my head, as it happens, this character emerged this young young woman botanist who was traveling to India possibly to a part of the country that I know very well and she's on a ship and she's on a quest and in some ways I think I had to write the book to find out what she was looking for because I didn't quite know at the time um, just as the reader is kept guessing through the narrative, um, through Evie's narrative, so was I. You know, what was she looking for? Um, and how does that connect to a larger story that I'm trying to tell? And as these things happen, you know, one idea unfurls and opens another. 
I I was in conversation with a friend, uh, you know, taking a walk by the sea, perhaps later that year, perhaps even the next, when this friend happened to tell me about Goethe and Goethean science. And I thought, that's interesting, but what exactly is Goethean science? Um, you know, just as one of the characters in my book asks the very same question. And I read up a lot about Goethean, you know, Goethean science, Goethe's scientific consciousness, and realized that there were ideas there that I could use to connect Goethe's story and Evie's story. Um, in opposition to, to Goethe, because Goethe offers a narrative of resistance in the book, is Linnaeus. Linnaeus, our, you know, happy plodder who's, you know, naming the world and everything in it and happily organizing everything into a system that he feels is most appropriate and which has actually no basis really to support it within the natural world itself. But, you know, he, it, we call him the, the, the father of botanical taxonomy for a reason. He was obsessed with putting things into boxes. And Goethe and Evie and Shai, eventually, we learn, are the narratives of resistance to Linnaeus's obsession with boxing and labeling the world. They swirl around him, offering a different way of seeing, offering a way of seeing that's, that has freedom and imagination and unity at its heart, rather than fixity, you know, there is fluidity. Um, and so that's really how the novel came into being. But it did really, I have to admit, take a long while. Uh, I, I believe it took some around some 10 years, if, correct yes. if I'm wrong. Yes. And uh, that must have involved so much of travel, humongous research, and then the actual act of writing. And then there was the pandemic also, right? Yeah. So then there was confinement. And so how yeah. did you cope with these changing scenarios? Mm -hmm. And at some point, did it get daunting? So what mm -hmm. did you do? How did mm -hmm. you keep going? That's such a good question, Archana. Um, in By some stroke of luck, I had managed to do most of my research, most of my reading in the libraries, um, you know, where I needed to be. So in London, in Sweden, in Germany, um, just before the pandemic hit. Uh, in fact, I was in Rome following Goethe's footsteps just when lockdown began. And so I was stuck at the heart of it all at the beginning of lockdown. Quite a story, but we'll save that for another day. Um, by some stroke of luck, as I said, I'd managed to finish at least uh, the gathering of material just before the pandemic began. Um, and so any other travel that I had planned after, you know, little bits here and there had to be set aside, if not cancelled altogether. And oddly enough, I think it was the confinement and I think it was the constrictions that actually fueled the love for writing about travel and movement within the book. Um, I sort of drew on all my memories of, of traveling and being able to, you know, wander quite freely, um, you know, um, uh, around. And that sort of, I think, drives all four of these narratives. Um, but the other things that I found, one was that Despite, you know, all of this chaos around us and the world pretty much feeling like it was coming to an end, I felt as though the question that I was asking at the heart of my manuscript while writing were all, was also a question that many others were asking around me, that it was a question, you know, um, that was at the heart of many conversations. Um, and this question was what is our relationship to our planet, especially at a time when we are in the middle of a pandemic that could very well have been ecologically, um, you know, motivated, ecologically um, 
um, because of the ecological crisis, that we were in this kind of terrible mess that we were in. Um, and so this question actually seemed so big and so resonant at the time that it actually helped me write because nothing else seemed to make sense except to write and try and answer this question. And the other thing that helped was that I was very, very, very lucky to have a small garden out front, um, you know, in the front of my little ground floor apartment. And um, I would take a break from the writing in my study, which was at the back of the house, um, and I'd take my cup of tea uh, into the garden and, you know, Sureshji, my lovely gardener, couldn't come anymore, you know, to work. So I had to take care of the garden in a way that I never had in the past. And I think that's what really changed me, um, the tending of a little garden, because it made me so attuned to the language of plants to listen to them, to, to, you know, to understand when they needed water, when they needed light, when they needed more shade. Um, it allowed me to have these conversations with plants that I think I had forgotten for the longest time, that perhaps, as you pointed out, you know, I might have been having in my childhood, but not really anymore as an adult. And the thing that I grew to understand and learn was that one may be still, especially at a time like lockdown filled with constriction and rules and diminishment one may be still but I think very very much in touch and in connection with the wider world and the plants in some ways taught me that because plants are mostly immobile they can't move they're you know in one place usually but they were so intricately connected to the vaster world, to the, you know, the change in seasons, to sunlight, to the shift in wind, um, to night and day. And I realized that even in stillness, there is constant transformation. That even in stillness, there is this connection to a much larger world. And in some ways, perhaps that was what we needed to learn while we were all in lockdown, that we could be still, we didn't quite need to travel as much as we, as we used to. Um, we could be still and, 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 and be connected. We could be still and also transformed. In fact, I wanted to ask you whether it is necessary for someone who wants to write well to also yeah. travel. Is that a prerequisite? <laughs> Um, I think there are no rules, really, because, um, you know, we, we know of many writers and poets who perhaps never really traveled outside their little neighborhood and yet wrote about the human condition and the, and the world with such ferocity and with such insight, you know. Um, so I really do think that it, it, it matters so much who you are and where you find your inspiration. But for me, um, particularly, travel and writing are intricately connected. In fact, sometimes I feel that they are the same act because they are both about moving, journeying from one point to the next and along the way, undergoing some kind of transformation and change. Um, I think also that travel and writing are connected for me in the way that they allow you to travel inward, to move inward. Um, when we journey, we, of course, move and we, you know, we, we are, you know, uh, physically in, 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 in motion um, and we are absorbing the outside world. But in that act of negotiating with newness and unfamiliarity, we are also in some ways traveling in. We are learning something about ourselves. How do we deal with something we're not used to, with the unfamiliar, with the new? Um, and I think writing forces you to do that as well. It is very much about building a world 
an external world, if you like. But in order to do that and to negotiate with that, you need to travel inside yourself. Um, I think traveling and writing are also very much about shifts in perspective. You cannot move, you cannot write without some kind of realignment happening within you, some kind of shift in perspective. Again, because of this negotiation with the new, the unfamiliar. Um, and so for me, you're absolutely, um, you know, you're absolutely right. Um, there is so much that connects traveling and writing, but perhaps I wouldn't say that it is a prerequisite. It might be for me, um, but for someone else, um, it could be something else entirely, you know? Yes. And uh, the characters, the four characters in your book are on a quest. And uh, like you said, uh, as you travel physically, you also go inward. You have mentioned elsewhere that you have uh, this sense of disquiet, just as you question, you know, what is our relationship with our planet? But you also mm -hmm. had this, who am I? And yeah. so, yes. So is your book, you know, this has it at the end of you know at the end of writing this book have you got any answers and how much of this was about finding your own place and identity even mm -hmm. if not in the beginning but during the process yeah um such a lovely question again archana i think um um i would um connect your question particularly to one of the the narratives in the book which is um, the story of Shai, uh, which is the story that cradles all the other stories um, in the novel. It's the story that lies on the outside. It's the story that is contemporary. It's set in the here and now. Um, it's the story that I hope offers a vast, almost geological perspective on things. Um, it's the narrative that I hope also reinserts and re-enlivens our engagement with indigenous knowledges and indigenous forms of, of living and being, um, which I think are incredibly important for us to relearn and, you know, re-acknowledge if we want to in any way live meaningfully and lightly and well on, on this planet. Um, but the, the character at the heart of that narrative, Shai, is similar to me. We share um, a similar story of leaving home at a very young age and um, in some ways being shaped very much by external narratives of where we should be. Not here in these hills, not in Shillong, because this is a troubled space. It has no jobs. It, it's there's always the possibility of something happening and curfews erupting and trouble erupting. And so go, go, go elsewhere, make a life elsewhere, be successful elsewhere, because there's no chance of that happening here. And I think Shai and I share that kind of directed, you know, um, movement that directed moving away from home and we also share the questioning of that narrative as we grow up what does it really mean you know to be home where do we belong um, how can we interrogate those narratives and 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 dismantle them a bit um, you know I can see that they were um, placed upon us by well-meaning elders, parents and grandparents who wished for, you know, for us to have a good life. But it's also our turn to make the decision whether we wish for that to be our narrative or not anymore. And so we share that movement out, but we also share that movement of return. And I found that I really struggled to write shy. At the beginning, I couldn't find her voice. I couldn't find her inner motivation. I couldn't really paint her inner landscape until because of the pandemic, I managed to stay home for longer than I ever had in decades. 
I could be in Shillong, I could teach online, I could be with, you know, parents, with the forests, with the hills, I could be in this place in a way that I haven't hadn't ever been here before. And only when that happened, did I go back to Shai's narrative and write that into her story. Of course, she's propelled by her own decisions, not by the pandemic. She decides to come back and see, okay, let me figure this out for myself for once. But we share that kind of space uh, and, you know, temporality. We both inhabit this, this little town, these hills for longer than we've ever done. And that changes something. So I think that, you know, they say life and art and art and life and how they mirror each other. And that's, you know, so much what happened with this narrative. And even if perhaps, you know, I'm not quite sure who I am, apart from being a storyteller, um, because I feel that that's something that changes so much all the time. I think that I'm much more sure of where home is. And perhaps that is the beginning of finding yourself. How beautiful is that? Uh, Janice, uh, we are in times where, uh, you know, the, we feel constant surveillance. There is so much rhetoric. There is noise. There is trolling. And uh, it's, it's not as if we all feel free. So... Mm -hmm. How have these circumstances uh, affected your writing? And do you feel, do you really feel free to write what matters to you? Again, such a good question. Um, I think perhaps more than 10 years ago now, gosh, um, <laughs> time still sits very funnily in my head, I have to admit. <laughs> I think somewhere I'm still a little bit stuck in 20, you know, in March 2020, still processing things. But let's just say a long, long time ago, <laughs> um, there was a time when there was a point when I thought I would quit everything, my job, you know, uh, my little, um, you know, place in Delhi, and I would just write. I would be a full time writer. And it was the hardest thing that I'd ever done. And, um, you know, I tried for a few years. I tried freelancing. I tried, you know, writing for magazines and uh, other publications um, and all of that. And at the end of that, of that time, of that period, I began to feel that my craft, my writing was beginning to be um, pressurized by, you know, the, the, the need um, to earn a living. Um, and, you know, the question then I would, I would ask before I started writing anything was how much money is this going to earn me? And that made me really deeply uncomfortable eventually because I thought this is not the kind of question that I want to begin with. This is not the kind of pressure that I wish to place on my storytelling. Sadly, we live, you know, still at a time in a, in a world where structures aren't quite in place to support artists and creative practitioners in the way that perhaps we could in a way that is, you know, better for them and, and more meaningful for them. Um, you know, we still live at a time when we need to earn that living, unless, of course, you're extremely privileged and you don't have to ever pay rent and pay bills. Um, but, you know, I'm not one of those people. And so actually the best thing that happened to me was finding a job and finding a job that um, I enjoyed, that helps, um, finding a job that supported and allowed for um, the writing. And, uh, uh, and I am, you know, referring to teaching and being at Ashoka, at a place like Ashoka, um, which gives me the structure and the support to write. And I felt this incredible freedom once I had that part of my life taken care of. 
you know, that, okay, I have a little bit of money coming in. I can pay my rent, can feed myself and my cat. Um, and now I can write what I want to write. And so I wrote Nine Chambered Heart and Everything the Light Touches in the same spirit of freedom and experimentation, um, you know, because finally I had that space um, to do so. Um, but it's tricky, you know, it's not an easy balance to strike. Um, it's, it's, it's not easy to manage the work and the writing and juggle all of these things all at once. But I would still urge any sort of writers out there, young writers out there, you know, who are thinking about giving up their job to freelance, you know, hold your horses, think about it a little more because your storytelling, your art, your craft, you know, it doesn't deserve to be pressurized like that. It changes it intrinsically. And you want to retain, you want to retain that, um, that freedom, you know, you want to retain that kind of, um, um, yeah, that kind of space for yourself. That's really a valuable piece of advice. And uh, Janice, I can see that we've almost come to the end of this conversation, but I cannot leave without asking you uh, the many names of your cat. <laughs> the ne many names of my cat, who was originally named Vincent, because, surprise, surprise, he has a little scrunched up ear, which I think, you know, he was perhaps hurt or maimed as a kitten. And his ear has always remained a little sort of misshapen. And so we thought, well, no better homage to the greatest post-impressionist artist there ever was than to name um, Kitty that. Um, but of course, as cats often do, he refused to respond to that name. And so we tried calling him Papu because we oh. thought if it was a North Indian cat, he might respond to a more North Indian sounding name. He refused. And so now we've just settled on Kitty, <laughs> which is the most <laughs> basic. <laughs> yes. Just one last question. What are you reading now? Oh, my goodness. I am actually reading um, this wonderful, big, fat novel by a writer from here. Uh, named Funeral Nights, and it's by this incredible Kasi writer who also writes in English, um, whose name is Kinpam Singh Nongkanri. It's, it's this fact. So it takes care of all my winter reading needs, and I would highly recommend it to everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janice. And here's Janice's book, Everything the Light Touches. Please go out and get a copy. It's a beautiful book. Yeah. Thank you, Janice, for your time and for this wonderful conversation. It's been such a pleasure. Such a delight, Arjuna. Thank you so much. <laughs>